Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Burden in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Stocks gain in Asia along with U.S. futures as Jay Powell reaffirms his view that the Fed will cut rates this year. But, he says, the central bank is in no rush to loosen policy. Reducing rates too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require <clears throat> even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. Oil's rally rolls on. Brent crude flirts with $90 a barrel as OPEC Plus sticks with supply cuts through to June. Plus, Janet Yellen goes to Beijing. The U.S. Treasury Secretary warns against decoupling from China, but says trade must be on a level playing field. Well, those are your headlines. Good morning. Welcome to Thursday. You had Jay Powell sticking to the script yesterday. Wait and see mode is still where the Fed is at. And that gave a bit of relief to stocks and bonds yesterday. You've got futures pointing to an even higher opening this morning on both sides of the Atlantic. And if we flip over to the cross asset picture, you can see ultimately the Fed chair's comments didn't really move the dial when it comes to where the markets are in terms of bets for when the Fed cuts are coming. You had Treasuries ending broadly higher yesterday, but now pretty steady. And now all eyes turn to the jobs report tomorrow. Remember, Powell said last month that an unexpected weakening in the labour market could warrant a policy response from the Fed. You've got the dollar a touch weaker. Its once close relationship with the Fed bets seems to have evaporated, but gold very much listening to Jay Powell. The yellow metal setting another record above $2,300 an ounce yesterday on the back of those comments. It's just a touch below that now, but every day this week it's hit a new high on the central bank pivot and the geopolitical risk. Speaking of which, oil, Brent, as I say, flirting with $90 a barrel after the OPEC Plus meeting, sticking with the current supply cuts. Could we see $100 a barrel by the late summer? JP Morgan's Natasha Kaneva says yes. And we'll dig into all of that throughout the programme. But let's get over to Asia now. You've got lots of holidays happening there, but Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn can take us through what is in action. Bonnie. Plenty of holidays, plenty going on as well, though, Lizzie, and some of it thanks to some of what you just laid out there. So China on holiday, Hong Kong on holiday but returns on Friday, and we have Taiwan on holiday as well as it tries to assess damage and, and rebuild to a certain extent and also find some more survivors from the island's earthquake yesterday. But do have a look at what is going on because markets around the world, it seems, are reacting to what Fed Chair Jay Powell said yesterday about, you know, continuing to expect to see rate cuts later on this year and to wait and see what happens with the inflation data. Also, don't forget that services data that came in a little bit, you know, less hot than anticipated. The Fed has been waiting on services to show a little bit of a cooling down, let's put it that way. So if you look at the MSCI Asia Pacific Index, you'll see we're up about eight tenths of one percent. Some of that has to do with Japan, up 1.3 percent. The other thing that's happening in Japan is that earnings start this week and investors are expecting maybe a little bit more of a payout now in terms of dividends and so on because Japan has been doing so well and companies have been doing so well and the yen has been weak as well, which has helped companies for the most part. So Japan up 1.3 percent. The cost be up 1%. That's a slightly different story there as well. Thanks to SK Hynix for some of these gains. SK Hynix up more than four and a quarter percent right now. It's going to invest $4 billion in a plant in Indiana in the United States, in fact. But it's going to do some research and development on AI chips. And really that's having a halo effect on chip stocks around Asia at the moment is helping those indices move higher, as well as the fact that those chip plants are coming back online as well in Taiwan after yesterday's tragic earthquake. So as you see, the cost be up 1%. But if we flip up the board, a little bit more volatility in currencies. So the yen today still trading around 151.70, perhaps not in the danger zone, but that might be thanks to a little bit of relief for the dollar, which had been strengthening day after day after day and finally saw a little bit of weakening today. The yuan, though, the renminbi, is one to keep an eye on because we were very, very close to the weakest part of the trading band once again today. It shows that the PBOC policymakers are really very close to more intervention if that does does bypass that. The offshore yuan, of course, has been, you know, flirting with that level for several days. The onshore yuan now as well, it would seem. And then I just wanted to point out copper because you mentioned earlier oil being on a tear. Well, we're seeing it across the commodity complex. Copper at the moment up another eight tenths of one percent. This partially thanks to the PMI data out of China earlier this week, but also all of those other reasons that you just laid out, Lizzie. 
Yeah, and yet iron ore dropping toward a 10-month low. Why? We'll dig into that later in the programme. Usually you'd see copper and iron ore moving in a similar direction, but we'll discuss the commodities picture in the programme. Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn in Dubai, we thank you for that update on Asia markets. And now let's dig deeper into the Fed story, because we had Fed Chair Jay Powell again signalling that the central bank is going to wait for clearer signals of lower inflation before the Fed cuts rates. Take a listen. These recent data do not however, materially changed the overall picture, which continues to be one of solid growth, a strong but rebalancing labor market, <clears throat> and inflation moving down toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path. On inflation, it is too soon to say whether the recent readings represent more than just a bump. We do not expect that it will be appropriate to lower our policy rate until we have greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2%. For more on this, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Critty Gupta. Critty, J. Powell's message seems pretty clear to me. Why is the market making it so difficult? Because he's not <laughs> the only one in charge, as you know, simply for the BOE. It's very uh, kind of touch and go in terms of what the consensus actually is. This diversion you're starting to see within the FOMC, going from even the most dovish people like Raphael Bostic, for example, reiterating that he may only see one cut in all of 2024, while some of his peers just 24 hours ago, Loretta Mester, Mary Daly, are saying, three are still on the radar. There's a massive difference, obviously, in terms of the read-through of that. And that's why I think the best part to way to look at this, interpret this, is what you're seeing in the bond market. Take a look at the 10-year yield, 436 right now. And if you just were to pull it out to an intraday chart, take my word for it, it's very choppy, which shows the market doesn't know who to listen to, doesn't know where the consensus is coming from because the wage data is so all over the place, because mm -hmm. the inflation data, we don't know if the bump that we saw, the bump higher that we saw in the last couple of months, and it has been two to three months of some hot data, that's just a temporary kind of bump, or is that something that is indicative of inflation going off the rails? So June, July or beyond, when to cut first? Did Powell make clear which data he's looking at to make that decision? I mean, he's sticking with his, his fan favorites, right? The wage data, the labor market is too soft, the, the PCE numbers. He didn't really go veer too much off script here. But I think what's interesting is he did say that, well, we are considering all the options. If you actually look at some of the nitty gritty of what he said, he very specifically said that this could be a reason to reevaluate in a couple of months, as opposed to in previous speeches, he's kind of backed himself into a little bit of a corner, to your point about the June and July. And that's why the markets are so careful about pricing in that June cut. Yes, it's below 50 percent, but it's still on the table because that was a time frame that Jay Powell gave before. The fact that he said this could potentially be a, the early indicator of getting off the rails, an early indicator of inflation being sustainably higher, that was the indication he gave. It's not his base case, of course, but it is something that he's saying, this is the questions we have to ask now. And speaking of backing yourself into a corner, where does it leave the European central banks, the BOE and the ECB, who might not want to jump first and go before the Fed? Well, they might not have much of a choice because at what every central banker loves to say is we're not watching the, what the other central banks are doing. We're kind of doing what's right for our own mm -hmm. country and nation, which is great. And right, it's an, a bit gigantic eye roll, but this would be a historic moment if the ECB were to cut first. But I think the difference is here is that, and we saw this in the inflation numbers yesterday, the inflation is coming down faster in the Eurozone. You aren't seeing that tick up in the data that you are seeing in the United States. And that's why that divergence actually makes sense. The fact, the difference I would say now is that markets are actually starting to believe in the best way to see that is in the currency picture. Yeah, indeed. And we're going to dig into that with our MLive team later on. But Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, thank you for joining us. And Kriti will be on markets today later in the morning. But now, let's get back to the geopolitics because we've got a significant meeting happening. NATO foreign ministers meeting in Brussels today as the alliance marks its 75th anniversary. Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg will be speaking later this morning at 9 a.m. UK time. But here's what he had to say after the Bloomberg scoop on his proposal for a $100 billion five-year funding plan for Ukraine. We are transforming NATO's comprehensive assistance package into a multi-year program of assistance. We are helping Ukraine move closer to NATO, NATO standards on everything from procurement or logistics. And we are supporting Ukraine's reform efforts to bring Ukraine ever closer to the alliance. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Natalia Drojak in Brussels, who's been all across this meeting. Natalia, I noted that Blinken's official plane broke down on the way to this meeting. Is the turbulence a sign of what's to come? 
Yes. Um, well, I think, you know, just the point on, on uh, you know, everything on, on the NATO allies agenda at the moment, I think top of mind is the war in Ukraine um, and how to make that, that aid uh, more sustainable over the long term, which is why we've we've seen this proposal come from Stoltenberg's office about uh, $100 billion uh, for Ukraine over five years. It's still not clear whether allies will will, will back that. Uh, there's a lot of questions from ministers about the viability of that plan and where the money will come from. But in general, allies want to figure out a way to, to make this aid more sustainable in light of uh, a lot of uncertainty in the political sphere with uh, with elections coming up in the U.S and a possible return by Donald Trump to the White House. Yeah, because perhaps that could undo this proposal, even if it goes through. So how united are allies about that, but also the challenges they're facing in general as we're at this 75th anniversary of the organization? Yes, I, I mean, as I mentioned, they're, they're facing these internal challenges, you know, with, uh, with a, a some doubts among allies about the commitment by the U.S. to uh, European security, not just because of the Trump threat, but for a while now the U.S. has been pulling away and shifting more focus towards Asia and China. And so European allies are realizing that they're going to have to step up more in a, in a much more significant way than they ever have. Uh, so you have these internal these internal dynamics, but at the same time you have the biggest land war on the continent that, that Europe has seen since uh, World War II, and you have all these other conflicts erupting, including in the Middle East. So they're having to manage all of these tasks at the same time. And, of course, they've got to pick a successor to Jen Stoltenberg. Where are we in that race? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the majority of allies had wanted to sign off on Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte at this meeting, um, but there was a bit of a surprise twist in, in recent weeks. Uh, the Romanians put forward their own candidate with President Klaus Johannes, so that's delayed uh, the timeline on, on signing this off, but the feeling is that that candidate came came forward a bit too late to make any real difference, so most likely... Ruta will be uh, uh, Jens Stoltenberg's successor, but it will just take a few more weeks to, to sign that off. Well, we're going to be speaking to the man himself. Uh, but Natalia Drozak in Brussels, thank you for that update on the NATO meeting. Stoltenberg is going to join the surveillance team for a live interview tomorrow. And they're going to discuss, of course, aid to Ukraine, the prospect of a Trump presidency and those succession plans. That interview at 12.30 p.m. UK time. Do not miss it. We've also got plenty more on the docket today, though. At 7.30 a.m. UK time, we get Swiss CPI for March. That's expected to have ticked up to 1.3%, though it has fallen rapidly in the past few months, just for context. It precedes the ECB's minutes at 12.30pm UK time. You've got a June cut, as Critty says, looking like a done deal, and therefore the focus turning to how many cuts will follow this year. An hour after that, we're going to get US initial jobless claims. We'll watch out for how many people were laid off as a result of the Baltimore bridge collapse, of course. And that'll tee us up for the main data event of the week, the US jobs report for March that comes out tomorrow. We'll also get Fed speak from Mesta, Muslim, Barkin, Harker and Goolsby. What a mouthful. Whatever happened to less is more. Hey, we've got so much Fed speak this week. But you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can find it by going to D-A-Y-B. Go. That's how I like to start my day with a cup of coffee. Coming up, we're going to go to the Middle East. Pressure on Netanyahu is mounting. A prominent member of Israel's war cabinet says national elections should happen as soon as September, not in 2026. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to 
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now to Israel. A prominent member of Israel's war cabinet says national elections should happen in September instead of as scheduled in 2026. The call from Brenny Gantz has ramped up pressure on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who's facing an international backlash over the assault on Gaza. Bloomberg's Paul Wallace joins us now for more from Dubai. Morning, Paul. I, I wonder if you could just give us some context on how influential Gantz is and if he pulled out of the war cabinet, would that force Netanyahu's hand? Hi, Lizzie. Well, t to start off with Benny Gantz, he is increasingly influential in Israel. He is now the most popular politician in the country with ratings far, far higher than those of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. If there was an election held uh, tomorrow, Benny Gantz's National Unity Party would, on would almost certainly come out with the, with the biggest number of seats in, in the Knesset, the, the parliament. He is an opposition leader, but he joined this emergency emergency war cabinet that's only made up of uh, f five members um, soon after Hamas's attack on October the 7th. And in fact, Gantz is one of only three voting members in that cabinet, the other two being Netanyahu and the defense minister, Yoav Gallant. So he's an extremely important person. As to the question about whether him pulling out of the war cabinet would collapse the government, uh, the answer is not necessarily. Netanyahu's coalition, which is uh, pretty broad-based but is very uh, right-wing, the most right-wing in Israel's history, still holds a majority uh, in parliament and in theory could survive even if the war cabinet itself uh, c collapsed. But I think we should be under no illusions. If Gantz pulled out, he hasn't said he will, um, but if, if he did, that would certainly weaken uh, Netanyahu's hand. So that's the domestic pressure. Internationally, you've also had Chuck Schumer, of course, the majority Senate leader, calling for early elections too. And you've got Biden and Netanyahu expected to speak on the phone later today. How isolated is Israel at this point after the killing of those seven aid workers? Is Netanyahu underestimating just how frayed the US-Israel relationship is at this point, Paul? I think that's what a lot of people are thinking, that he is underestimating just how strained uh, and, and angry the, the US is becoming, let alone Israel's other allies in the West and even in the Arab world. In terms of its isolation, the US is still backing Israel solidly and is still providing it um, um, military hardware for, for its war against Hamas in Gaza. And everything that the White House has said suggests there's no way that it's going to limit weapon sales to Israel or put conditions um, on their use. So in that sense, Israel still has the firm backing of, of the, the U.S., which is by far its most important ally. And Netanyahu, he knows U.S. politics very well. Some might argue that he is underestimating just how angry um, people in America and, and beyond are with the war in Gaza right now. But he is also a pretty astute uh, tactician, and he seems to be banking on American support staying um, for this war in in, in Gaza, even if he uh, even if he follows through with things like uh, sending forces into the city of Rafah. Yeah. Okay. So that the latest on Israel. Bloomberg's Middle East and North Africa editor Paul Wallace. We thank you for that update. Of course, the geopolitical risk feeding into the oil story. And next up, we're going to discuss the oil rally rolling on. We'll take a look at why some analysts say Brent could hit $100 a barrel this year. Stay with us for that. This is Bloomberg. Our baseline view assumed since unchanged since last June assumed that we'll be hitting $90 by May. So it, it does seem that it's you know being brought forward by about a month and we'll be there by April. Uh, but again, you know, that as you absolutely correctly pointed out, the risk is that actually on the way to our price forecast, we will be hitting $100 as well. 
That was JP Morgan's head of global commodity strategy, Natasha Kaneva. So no surprises here. OPEC Plus sticking to its supply cuts despite crude prices at almost $90 a barrel in London, the highest this year. And Natasha, they're telling us you could see oil, uh, you could see oil at $100 a barrel by August or September. Let's get more now from Bloomberg senior energy reporter Stephen Stapchinski. Stephen, I had a note in my inbox from SEB's commodities team saying that the higher oil price is more about tighter supply than geopolitics. Are they right? I mean, I think certainly this is a story of fundamentals. And what's what's most interesting about it is when you looked at the fundamentals coming into the new year, I'm sure I was sitting in this chair in December saying how everything was looking pretty bearish uh, for 2024. But OPEC Plus has come through. They've, they've, they've had their cuts. They were expecting some froth in the market. So they've carried through the cuts for the first quarter put them through into the second quarter. They had a meeting yesterday saying that they're going to extend them through. Through They reaffirm that they will extend them through June. And, and demand has been a bit more resilient than I think some people had expected um, with the economy kind of, kind of trudging along. And all of that together is feeding into uh, a, a bit of a deficit. The IEA says that there's a deficit uh, for o the oil market in, in the second quarter. At the same time, you also have a few different things happening around the world. You've got Mexico reducing... Um, their exports of heavier crude to refiners, that's going to cause a bit of an issue. And on top of all of that, I think one interesting thing to look at is at the OPEC Plus meeting yesterday, they kind of reaffirmed as well that they've got to hit their targets uh, when it comes to their cuts. Iraq has been pumping a bit higher than what they had promised. Mm -hmm. Russian oil also rising. So all that together is kind of driving this fundamentals view, which, you know, J.P. Morgan just said $100 yeah. barrel of oil. We're at $90 right now, Brent. So it'll be an interesting few months. Just really briefly, Stephen, I also want to talk about this slide in European natural gas prices continuing. When you've got European economic activity sputtering along, how much further could they fall? You know, I, I think what's interesting is they could continue falling, especially since they, they you know, their inventories are so high. I think one of the factors to look at, European prices and Asian prices are sort of linked to a degree. And um, if, if prices fall low enough, it could trigger some buying in Asia. Uh, the Chinese, um, as well as India and Southeast Asian countries, might be interested in buying some LNG. So less LNG will go to Europe, more will go to, to Asia. And that could act mm. as sort of a floor. Um, so we could fall a little bit. But maybe it won't, you know, collapse if, if Asia comes to the rescue. All right, Bloomberg senior energy reporter Stephen Stapchinski, we thank you for that update. And we've got a lot of action happening in the commodity space. You've had gold setting a new record, $2,300 an ounce. This, of course, on the expectation of rate cuts this year. You've got copper hitting a 14-month high. Goldman sees a high of $12,000 by Q1 next year. So you might say it's curious that you've got iron ore dropping towards a 10-month low, given curious because... Iron ore and copper tend to move in the same direction when it comes to China news. But essentially, you've got uh, copper more useful, more broad in its utility, and also supply and demand dynamics varying there. But speaking of China, we'll speak about the Treasury Secretary's visit there next. So stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This has been Bird Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Burden in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Stocks gain in Asia along with U.S. futures as Jay Powell reaffirms his view the Fed will cut rates this year. But, he says, the central bank's in no rush to loosen policy. Reducing rates too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require <clears throat> even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. Oil's rally rolls on. Brent crude flirts with $90 a barrel as OPEC Plus sticks with supply cuts through to June. 
Plus, Janet Yellen goes to Beijing. The U.S. Treasury Secretary warns against decoupling from China, but says trade must be on a level playing field. Well, good morning. Welcome to Thursday. And if we just think back to Jay Powell's remarks yesterday, we're still in wait and see mode. Not a lot changing when it comes to his message there. So you had relief for stocks and bonds yesterday, and you can see it's set to continue later today. Futures pointing to a higher opening both in the U.S. and in Europe. And if we flip over to the cross asset picture, you can see really those comments from Powell didn't move the dial much when it came to expectations for rate cuts from the Fed. Still pretty much on a knife edge when it comes to whether we'll have a June cut. You had Treasuries ending broadly higher yesterday. The two-year Treasury yield currently at 4.68%, so higher a basis point this morning. But the dollar has been a little weaker this morning. Uh, really, it's not as coupled as closely with expectations for Fed moves. That relationship seems to have evaporated somewhat. Gold, though, very much listening to the Fed chair, Jay Powell. It has hit another record high. Every day this week it's done that. $2,300 an ounce it smashed through, just below that level at the moment. And Brent, $89 a barrel. We've been discussing just there uh, the OPEC Plus meeting, sticking to supply cuts, but also factoring in the geopolitical risk. Could it hit $100 a barrel by late summer? JP Morgan reckons so. But let's get over to Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn. She's got an update on how Asia markets are faring. Vonnie. Lizzie, thank you. Well, we are off the boil now on some of these markets, but still a nice rally today. Bigger picture, China, Hong Kong and Taiwan are all closed. Hong Kong will be trading, though, in the Friday session. So, as you can see, we are counting on some markets to keep us higher in this rally today. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index up about six tenths of a percent now off its highs. The Nikkei was up as much as 1.6 percent earlier. It's up just less than 1 percent now. Plenty of good news coming out of Japan, including the fact that we're starting earnings season for Japanese companies and they're starting to make announcements. So we had Konica Minolta, for example, announcing job cuts just a little bit earlier on. That sent that stock higher. It probably was enough to put some fear into the market. But we are also seeing investors expecting more in the way of dividends, more in the way of payouts from companies. So that could be coming down the pike this quarter for Japanese companies. And then we have the chip story. We have the Kospi rallying now more than 1%. That's thanks in part to SK Hynix, which is investing $4 billion in a factory and a research and development center in Indiana in the United States. And that's having a halo effect on chip stocks across the region. And it's also sending the Kospi to a 1.1% gain right now. Now, across the region, we're also seeing the re-onlining of factories after the tragic Taiwan earthquake yesterday, which has killed at least nine so far and several others injured. Also, we don't know how many others are still trapped or missing. But the factories themselves, at least, are coming back online, and that's having a positive impact on the chip players. Elsewhere, it's the macro story, right? It's a little bit of relief for the dollar, which is helping with some currencies, including the yen, 151.69, so slightly away from the danger zone. We also had comments from the former Bank of Japan member, Mako Koto Sakurai, who said that the bank would be likely to wait until around October before we see another interest rate hike. So that's likely to be playing into those dynamics today, too. A little bit less satisfying to see the yuan trading very close to the weakest end of its trading band, because we've been seeing that now for a few days. And it's been obvious that the PBOC and authorities have been watching it closely, perhaps even intervening or at least stopping swaps contracts going ahead and so on, doing small things like that. But it's not enough to dissuade the bears, right, that we're going to continue to weaken. So we are seeing both the onshore and the offshore flirt with that weekend of the trading band. And then you mentioned commodities earlier rising. Copper up another nine-tenths of one percent. China PMI is percolating through the market. Maybe not the iron ore market, Lizzie, but definitely the copper market, which <laughs> is really at a 14-month high at this point. All right, still plenty happening in Asia markets as it happens, even though China, Hong Kong and Taiwan are on holiday as a reminder. Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn in Dubai bringing us the sunshine. We thank you for that update. Now, let's get back to the Fed chair, Jay Powell. He spoke yesterday signalling that policymakers will need clearer information of lower inflation before cutting interest rates. But he says the bump in prices recently hasn't altered the Fed's border trajectory. 
Well, let's bring in Mark Cranfield from Bloomberg's M Live team now. Mark, we saw Treasury yields going through a bit of a round trip yesterday. The hawkish uh, comments from Bostic sent yields higher. Then you had Powell a little dovish, sending front end yields lower again. You also had the economic data feeding into the story. What market reaction could we see from the jobs data we have yet to come? Well, really, I think if there's going to be any big changes, we're going to see it in the foreign exchange world. So we're in a pretty interesting situation here for the, for the U.S. dollar. Positioning-wise, traders are pretty long U.S. dollars. They have been for a few weeks, which not, is not surprising, really. We've had a strong set of U.S. data. We've also had fairly hawkish speakers from the Federal Reserve pushing back against early rate cuts. So we come to this point where the jobs data comes out tomorrow. Market is generally relatively long of the dollar you can see it especially in the dollar yen which is still getting not far from 152 but people will run out of patience if they don't see some joy for the positions they're built up so if we get a a number in the non-farm payrolls which doesn't quite meet expectations a little bit on the soft side that could trigger quite a wave of us dollar selling which spills over into next week and if dollar yen starts to go down that may trigger the euro and the pound australian dollar they all look like currencies which could benefit quite a lot if there's a bit of a turn in the US dollar. Even if the jobs data is very strong, pushes up dollar yen, we would expect the Japanese authorities to have limited patience as to how much further they allow it to go. So not far above 152, you can imagine the Japanese authorities will say enough is enough and they'll start supporting the yen. That will trigger sales of dollar yen into next week and that will probably help the US dollar come down generally. So either way, It's a very big 24 hours for the U.S. market, especially for people holding long dollar positions. And when you've got rate cuts delayed, Mark, what does it mean for bonds and equities? Well, the bond market is probably going to go through a bit of a sideways pattern for some time. We've we've actually really haven't seen a huge difference in yield over the past three months. They've just been fluctuating around. That can continue for a while until we get the next set of dot plots, which tells us maybe there's only two cuts coming, but that's still a way off. So for now, a bit more range trading. But from the equity market point of view, they can absorb that quite easily. People looking at equities have been able to deal with 5% interest rates for a very long time. They've got used to it. They've factored it into their equations. There's nothing really to stand in their way. As long as the earnings numbers start to come out okay, we get the big banks starting next week. If we get through that without too much trouble, they can live with rates pretty much staying on hold for a while. They've got the AI component as well. So the equity market can probably absorb it a lot better than the bond market can. All right, Mark Cranfield from Bloomberg's M Live team, we thank you for that. And I mean, one person who's going to be not too displeased if it takes the Fed a little longer would be Andrew Balls at PIMCO. Uh, the, you've seen PIMCO betting the Fed's going to cut rates less than other central banks. Why? Because they have this higher proportion of fixed rate mortgages uh, and therefore it takes longer, they reckon, for monetary policy to feed through and therefore they've been favouring debt here in Europe and the UK instead. Interestingly, we're going to be speaking to Andrew Balls later in the day on markets today. But let's stay in the U.S. and flip to the politics, the geopolitics, because U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is visiting China for the second time in nine months. During a stop in Alaska, she emphasized the need for continued cooperation. We have agreed that it's important to both of us that we don't want to uh, decouple our economies. Um, We want to continue and we think we both benefit from trade and investment but that it needs to be in a level playing field. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's senior editor, Bill Ferries. Bill, what's the extent of this overcapacity issue? Well, it's uh, becoming a major concern for the U.S. uh, And frankly, you have to include the context that this is an election year. But uh, U.S. and some allies are increasingly concerned that, you know, China is looking to export more of its industrial capacity as its, uh, its ability to absorb some of that capacity at home seems diminished with uh, moderating growth. And uh, particularly in the clean area uh, industry, that's been a priority for the Biden administration in terms of diversifying the supply chains and bringing a lot of that production back. 
So that's, uh, that's an area they're looking at very closely. Janet Yellen's trip, at least the message of her trip, seems time to uh, give a little bit of a heads up on what may be coming to Chinese leaders, as well as to just provide a little bit of uh, more stability in this relationship between Beijing and Washington. You remember there had been almost uh, or more than a year break in communication between the two sides until Biden and Xi met uh, late last year in the San Francisco area. This is adding to the sense that communication can continue even amid all of these disagreements about, uh, about uh, overcapacity from the U.S. side, about the uh, restrictions on technology transfers and things like that. Yeah, it's interesting because the call between Biden and Xi, the readout of it, seemed a little touchier on the Chinese side than the U.S. side. Are we getting a sense that that's the, uh, how things will come over the next few weeks as we have the Yellen visit, but also Antony Blinken heading over to China? Yeah, I, I think the Chinese know that, uh, that there are some more trade restrictions coming. You know, in, in addition to these potential trade barriers on clean energy, uh, there has been a lot more talk about the U.S. pressuring allies, such as South Korea and Japan, to limit their servicing of uh, high-tech semiconductor equipment that was sold to China before some sanctions came in place. Uh, so it's a rough, complicated relationship at this point that will probably be made more turbulent as the U.S. gets closer to the uh, November presidential election. Um, so I think, you know, China's aware of the, the politics involved. At the, same, uh, on, at the same time, they are interested in luring uh, investment that they can. They're interested in keeping companies involved in the Chinese economy. You saw President Xi meeting last week with uh, a number of American CEOs and executives. So uh, they realize that they want to stay connected. They don't want trade battles to become worse. Uh, but the reality is that it could be a very rocky road ahead in, in the coming months. Okay, Bloomberg senior editor Bill Ferries, we thank you for that update on the Yellen visit to China. And coming up, Disney CEO wins a vote of confidence. But what does it mean for the boardroom drama? Will it have a fairy tale ending? We'll bring you that story next. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, Walt Disney shareholders have handed CEO Bob Iger a big vote of confidence, rejecting dissident investor Nelson Peltz's bid for a board seat. Sources say that Peltz won just 31% of the votes cast, and the stock fell the most in more than six months following the result. But it's still up almost 32% so far this year. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Charlie Wells to pass this drama. What more would we expect from Disney? How did Bob Iger win this vote, Charlie? Yeah, so he treated it a lot like a political campaign, and it was probably the one of the most expensive, one of the most hard-fought proxy battles in recent history. I mean, Disney spent $40 million on these campaigns. The Pelt side spent $25 million. And it really did feel like a political campaign. They sent out mailers to a lot of shareholders. A lot of individual investors owned Disney stock, about 40%. Um, and they even sent out some promotional videos, Disney did, indicating how they wanted people to vote using Disney characters. Okay, well that would persuade me. I'm a Minnie Mouse gal myself. Is Nelson Pre Pre Peltz therefore going to retreat in this fight? So Peltz's uh, Tryon Partners owns $3.5 billion worth of Disney shares, and he's tried to get seats on the board before. He indicated even before yesterday's vote that he would continue to watch the company. I mean, he's got a lot of skin in the game, so it seems like he's not really going anywhere. And some of the issues that he brought up in this campaign weren't solved yesterday. He had a lot of issues with Disney's content. He had issues with Disney's succession planning. And of course, those are problems that weren't solved yesterday. So therefore, where does Disney go from here? I mean, they really need to be razor focused on Iger's turnaround plan. And he's been really trying to update, say, ESPN for the streaming era. They've been investing a lot in parks. And I mean, we think a lot about Disney movies, but Disney parks actually bring in about 70 percent of that company's profits. They've invested some 60 billion dollars in those parks. It's looking pretty good, but they've got to stay razor focused focus because all eyes are on them. Okay, well, Charlie, thank you for that. Bloomberg's Charlie Wells with an update on the Disney drama. Now to some other stories making news this morning. Bloomberg's learned that Apple's investigating a push into personal robotics, a field with the potential to become one of the company's ever-shifting next big things. 
Engineers at the tech giant have been exploring a mobile robot that can follow users around their homes and also an advanced tabletop home device that uses robotics to move a display around. We're told it's unclear whether the products will ultimately be released. Elsewhere, shares in Paramount surged more than 15% after reports that Shari Redstone is getting closer to selling her stake in the film and TV giant to David Ellison's Skydance. Redstone has been weighing a sale of the family holding company National Amusements to Ellison for nine months. For months, I should say. National Amusements holds a near 80% voting stake in Paramount Global, the parent of CBS and MTV. Now, asset manager Aviva, part of the insurance group uh, Aviva, is tapping Australia's pension funds to partner in private deals in the UK and Europe. As the surging pool of retirement savings there lures more offshore suitors, the firm, which manages 262 billion euros of assets globally, has been talking to some funds about co-investments in logistics centres and residential developments as well in its push to double its real assets portfolio over the next five years. Meanwhile, Aviva's CEO says progress towards gender parity in UK financial services is too slow. Amanda Blank is regarded as a champion for diversity and equality in Britain and is one of the few female leaders of a European blue chip. In an interview with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix, she highlighted the importance of shared parental leave. If you're looking at the FTSE 100 and you have 10 female CEOs, 90 male CEOs, you have to say, I mean, something's not quite right about that. And if we look in financial services, and I'm the government's women in finance uh, charter champion, we're seeing 1% improvements year on year. Now, that's good, and we should celebrate that, but it's not quick enough. Um, so I think we, we have to have a look at you know, what, what's going wrong, and it's really the pipeline of, uh, of women, if I talk about gender, women coming through, that is not strong enough. So we have to make sure that we keep women you know at work being promoted um, but always the best person for the job but making it easy for families to for, the, for the, the, the man and the woman to be able to work. But is that flexibility? I mean, I know there's been, uh, and you know, you've testified and we saw the episode with the Garrett Club. Is yeah. it still easier for a man to do business in the city? I'm not sure it's easy for a man to do business. Look, I think we have seen definitely some bad behaviours and, you know, certainly I, I asked for for women to contact me prior to giving evidence of the Treasury yes. Select Committee and, and heard about lots of very, very bad experiences. But I think what you have to do is get shared parental leave, right? If, I'm looking, yeah. if you're looking for what makes it easier, you know, at, at Aviva, 80% of our men take the full six months of parental leave. Now, I think that sets then the tone right from the very beginning of childcare responsibilities, yeah. that that is a shared responsibility. Yeah. That makes a really big difference. I think at that point, it then becomes easier for the men and the women to do well. And what we want clearly is for, for both to do well. But so is that more important than sexism in the city? I mean, I was fascinated, you know, for me, it was a watershed moment because this was on LinkedIn and you say, yeah. you know, I, I would like to hear from testimonies of people that have had, um, you know, uh, allegations, e either assault or bad experiences being yeah. a woman in the city. That was quite powerful. Yeah, it was powerful. And, and I mean, it was very emotional, actually, right. for the because I hundreds and hundreds of private messages from that. So you do still ex see that some women are yeah. experiencing yeah you know, bad behavior, yeah. um, and, and, and you know, that is clearly wrong, and that has to be dealt with by organizations. But I think there's the behavior point, and then there's the sort of systems processes that you yes. put in place to make sure that opportunities are available for both yeah. men and women to succeed. But I think the behavior has to be dealt yeah. with, it has to be yeah. dealt with by organizations, um, and women have to feel that yeah. if they speak up, that that will be dealt with. Do, do you think that's gone back, backwards actually, that less people want to speak up? I'm not yeah. sure that it's gone backwards. I think that people are now more prepared to call it out. So you are seeing more examples of that. It's hard, it's hard to say yeah. if it's gone backwards, because I think 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't be hearing about this at all. An important conversation there. The Aviva CEO, Amanda Blanc, speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. And you can catch more of that interview on Bloomberg UK at 9.30am London time. Well, 
Next up, we're going to talk about the recent Fed speak, including the Fed Chair Jay Powell yesterday. If your head is spinning, we've still got Mester Muslim, Barkin Harker and Goolsby to come today. We'll tell you our analysis on whether the Fed is still hawkish and how dovish it's getting in terms of that Fed speak. So stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Recent readings on both job gains and inflation have come in higher than expected. The economy added in an, av an average of 265,000 jobs per month uh, in the three years through February, a faster pace than we have seen since last June. These recent data do not, however, materially change the overall picture, which continues to be one of solid growth, a strong but rebalancing labor market, <clears throat> and inflation moving down toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path. If the economy evolves broadly as we expect, most FOMC participants see it as likely to be appropriate to begin lowering the policy rate at some point this year. Of course, that outlook is still quite uncertain and we face risks on both sides. Reducing rates too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require <clears throat> even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. Fed Chair Jay Powell reiterating that his central bank is still in wait and see mode. And if your head is spinning from all of the Fed speak we've been having this week, fortunately, Bloomberg Economics been tracking it all for us. Every single word of it. And they reckon that if you look at sentiment, actually, it's still in the hawkish side, but becoming increasingly dovish. Cautious is the word that Mike McKee would use. But where does that lead central banks in Europe who might not want to go first before the Fed? If we flip the board, you can see the ECB may cut ahead of the Fed. This is what markets are currently pricing. Uh, and where does that leave currencies? Well, a potential risk here in Europe. But still to come on the programme, uh, next up we've got markets today and they're going to be speaking to Andrew Balls, PIMCO's CIO for Global Fixed Income. So do catch that interview at 8am UK time. Kriti Gupta and Guy Johnson will be with you next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 